after the University of Calabasa will follow in a tradition we sing all the stanzas. Can we go the national? Chancellors, the Registrar, the University Librarian, the Provost College of Medical Sciences, Dean of Graduate School, Chairman Committee of Deans, former Professor, former Vice Chancellors present, Deans of Faculties, all Directors present, all Professors present, Heads of Departments, Chairman Ceremonial Committee, the 36th Convocation Lecturer, who will be duly recognized in the week of time, parliamentarians here present, all gentlemen of the clergy present, our royal fathers, service commanders, members of the Crossover State Executive Council, members of the University of Calabar community, Gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, may I formally welcome you to the 36th Convocation Lecture of this great university. The lecture in focus today is harmonizing diversity for national development. Our 36th Convocation Lecturer is already seated and when it is time, he will do justice to the subject. I have a very long list of introduction, but I won't be able to go through them. The introduction will be done in uh, stages as we get on. But permit me to do a very few of them that is just needful with respect to today's event. 
First, I want to recognize the chairman for today's event, who is one of us. He's what you may say, he doesn't need so much introduction. He's been on the saddle. He remains till tomorrow the very seventh vice chancellor of the Raka, Professor Ivala Ejema Usu, CFI. But he is the vice chancellor. May look like a very well known name. But when we come to an event like this, you still need to project a little to say that the woman there today, by history, still remains our first female vice chancellor and 11th vice chancellor of this institution. <laughs> Professor Florence Opinio, welcome. We have very capable deputy vice chancellors working with that. And first on the list is the deputy vice chancellor administration, Professor Inanta. <laughs> we also have the deputy vice chancellor academic, Professor Angela Oyeta. <laughs> and then we have the deputy vice chancellor researches, linkages, and research linkages and collaboration, Professor Peter Okafo. The man that is our chief scribe, scribe to senate, scribe to council, scribe to congregation, our only ambassador in the house. The custodian of our books is also here. If we had no library, we shouldn't be here. So they did a very good work on our behalf. Professor David G. University Library. Then we also have our university professor, Mr. Joseph Ojo. The provost of the College of Medical Sciences is also here, Professor Ngim Ngim. Dean of Graduate School, Professor Ian Ugana Young. Chairman Committee of Deans, Professor Ajake Anim. 36 convocation letter I said will be properly introduced. But he's here with two of his friends, very wonderful friends in ministry. The Bishop of Katsina, Most Reverend Gerald Musa. <laughs> and then we have the one in the house. The Auxiliary Bishop of Calabar, Most Reverend Professor Christopher Marcelo. And then we also have for today, by also, remember I talked about the seventh vice chancellor, the ninth is also here, Professor James Epoke. <laughs> and then one man who has a serious job to perform will also say we will be other rounds of introduction as we get on please. I hope that is understood. We want to pray. Our 36 convocation lecturer is a clergy. There are so many of them in the house. Please, can we rise together to pray? <laughs> Reverend Father Paulita, please. The Saturday, the burden is on you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and eternal Father, we thank you for your gift of life. We thank you for the opportunity that you have granted us to come together as members of this great family, the University of Calabar. We thank you for our Vice Chancellor for this pride you have brought to our institution. We thank you for the guest rector who has come all the way, the distinguished servant of the church, and all the bishops here present. My brothers and my sisters, we ask the Lord to speak through the words of the servant, Bishop Koka. He touched our hearts so that we may hear and we may change. Together, let us build a nation where we are judged not by where we come from, but by the fact that we are one people. Lord, as you brought us together, guide and protect us. May all we do here be to the glory of your name, so that the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit may be glorified now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. At this point, we we'll want to listen to the chairman for this, today's event. But I want to make a request, my dear chairman. Okay, you know, that's what I wanted to say. We've not seen you for a long time. So we want to have a full glare of your person today as you come. Let's put our hands together and open the cell guys. It's a long list of protocol, so uh, let me say I um, lean on the protocol that has been so well established by the MC. But I must recognize our inaugural lecturer, Bishop Kuka, and the, the person at the saddle who is doing wonders, who has proved that what men can do, women can do even better. I thank you for this ladies and gentlemen. Let me most sincerely welcome our 36th Convocation Lecturer, Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, KSM, to the University of Calabar, and indeed the, the state, the state. Bishop Kuka, you have always uh, known me as uh, Deputy Governor of Cross River State. But indeed, this is where I really belong. This is my home. This is a university that I transferred to from the Amadou Bello University in 1994. And uh, this is the university. This is the university I served as the acting vice chancellor when my vice chancellor was uh, uh, removed from office. And this is the university I served for a full term of five years as vice chancellor. As you heard, I'm the seventh vice chancellor of this university. Seven is very significant. So this is where I belong. I'm, I'm always very pleased to come back here, especially when I come and see all the young men I left behind here working so hard. Most of them are not just officers of the university. They are professors. They are professors. Those in the non-academic uh, or, or the senior staff cadre are very high up, deputy registrars, principal, assistant registrars, and so on and so forth. So I am always very pleased to be here. Let me also specially congratulate for steering the affairs of this university. Time of national strike by the uh, senior staff and non and uh, junior staff non-academic staff unions. Usually, when they say there is a national strike while I was vice chancellor, or when the senior staff go on strike, it doesn't bother me so much. But when they say NASU is part of the strike, you know, it is really terrible. So for you to, I don't know what magic, whether you perform the type of magic I need to perform, to be able to get them on your side. I was uh, hoping that there would be some barricade at the gates as we come and they will be struggling to see, ah, police keep them off. That is, has not happened. That means you know you are honest in handling union affairs. I want to congratulate the lecturers of this university, the professors for working so hard. Despite eight months of strike, we have not lost any academic session. They have worked so hard. My daughter there sitting there is a dean of uh, 
Allah in medical science. My son, remember to take time, some time out to relax a bit. Take some time to relax a bit. Because that's, anyway, I can also say when I give that kind of advice, uh, my wife doesn't like it because she knows that I was warned several times. I will go to the field to collect soil samples. I will come back. I'm bringing you up, strengthening you up. Please keep it up. And when we see the results that you have posted this particular that we have 32 first class honors is unprecedented in this university. We have 438 PhD degrees of which my very reverend Father Bob is one of them. I'm so proud of him. The Commissioner Stephen O'Day is one of them. He's saving a, a double, another PhD. So many of them are here. If Bukele has been here in this matter, John Lafford. And so I, I'm very, very elated to see this happen. 754 master's degrees. It's no mean achievement. However, going forward, please do not sacrifice quality for quantity. Do not sacrifice quality for quantity. I know that while I was vice chancellor, there was one professor who I had retired. I wanted us to make him a professor emeritus. And I said, let's look at his CV. We looked at his CV. Apparently, he had only graduated one master's degree student. But he was a well-renowned professor, well-known, in and out. And I said, but with this CV, you cannot be a meritorious professor. You can't. Because there's nothing meritorious about the CV. You have not brought up people. You have not trained people. You have not supervised enough research. And the Senate backed me up, and he was denied that appointment. And going forward, I now said, look, we must do something about this. It looks like it's not that the, the academics are they're not brilliant enough to do this publication. But they didn't see it. They saw it as one of those things they had to do. Some students stayed here for 10 years. They couldn't get a PhD. Some say seven years, master's degree. Where? Who side? And that was not acceptable. I now convinced the chairman of council then that we must include students of ambition, postgraduate of ambition, as part of the requirements for promotion. That for you to say that you are an associate professor. You should have supervised at least two master's degree students who started that low. And that was to say that you are, you are, you are a professor. You must have supervised at least four master's degrees and all two PhD students. So, those most people who were ready for promotion that year, they said that uh, it was a, a case of which I have climbed the ladder and now I'm pulling the ladder down. And I said, no, go and look at my own CV. How many PhDs I have graduated? And how many master's degree students I have graduated? I will not tell you to do what is impossible or what you can tell me about. And everybody kept his mouth shut when it became clear. But it looks like now that people are now doing more they are now focusing more on the students. Graduate, 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 so that I can add you to my number. <laughs> That's my feeling. Please, that should also be taken care of. You should just check it. So that you don't, don't want to be in the temptation of even writing a thesis for your students. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Because at the end of the day, when you say that this man holds a PhD, Society has certain expectations of it. And when you is in an environment which is academic, people will ask who was his supervisor. And believe it or not, if they
they say this is mine. They will dig into your character. Whether you cut corners, whether indeed you are even what you are sought. So it will reflect back on you. Please, as much as you should do your work of trying to graduate students, please make sure they are solid and they are qualified to do so. That's my, uh, my advice. In other words, let us not sacrifice quality or quantity. Now, coming to today's topic, harmonizing diversity for national development. That's what Bishop Kuka is going to talk to us about. And I guarantee you, none of you will feel, will sleep, none of you will feel sleepy. It's an erudite, erudite, I think you should be a professor, sir. <laughs> Bishop, Bishop, if I was still a vice chancellor, I would have conferred on you the professorship of this university. <laughs> because I know that you are an erudite professor. Now, he will elucidate what is to be done here today, what's this topic. But for me, <laughs> how do you create harmony in diversity? How does diversity, how can it promote national development? I guess these are the, some of the questions that Father Kuka will be trying to answer today for us. Because in Nigeria, we have so many people who say, most books will tell you we have more than 250 uh, ethnic groups. Some are, think they are more specific and say, no, we have 371 ethnic groups. But as I was reading literature about this last night, I was looking for my own ethnic group, Agwagune, and I didn't see it. So I said, this list is not complete. I must protest. Agwagune is not included. Why? You see, I saw Boki and Uki. Uki there, so you have no, no one. No problem. Paramanula book is here. So, also, my Paramanula is also here. Paramanula, we need to do something about it. Yeah, you know. Now, we have so many ethnic groups in this country. We have so many religious groups, mainly Christianity, Islam, and traditional religions. We have a situation in which some religious groups think that they are more than their others and therefore they should lord it over the others. We have a situation where some, even ethnic groups, think that they have monopoly of violence. They, 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 they are stronger than everybody else. And anytime there is uh, fighting anywhere, you press it to them. You have a situation where there are some ethnic groups within us that think so they are more intelligent than any other person. And therefore they don't even give others a chance to even contribute when it comes to any discussion, any uh, national discourse. You have a situation in which you have certain um, communities that live within the desert. Others live in the river, in the river itself, not even river line, right? in the river. We have so much diversity. We have a situation in which you have, even in income, some are extremely poor, some are just poor, some are middle class, others are super rich. This is just diverse, and yet we must all coexist to bring harmony. We have several diversity in interest. You have, especially gender. 
male, female. Age, youth. In fact, these days the youth say they have taken, they want to take over. What they don't know is that to take over, you want you it should be based on experience. First expire that experience, then you can take over. Otherwise, when they put you there, you begin to falter. That's the reality of today. The youth want to take over. The women think that it is now their turn to take over. The men say, no, we have been in this area. We must continue to dominate. These are issues of diversity. There are so many areas of diversity that we have in this country. In the country. However, I think that the appropriate person who will discuss this and distill this for us is the Bishop Kuka. And I will leave that to him. Bishop Kuka, I will leave this to you when it's done to elicit. Thank you very much and very much. Thank you so much. Can we put our hands together for the chairman? Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Before I invite the Vice Chancellor for her address, this time meeting to make a little round of introduction. I need to recognize the present is Royal Highness, a team doctor of Asuko Ipeyo OON Chairman Divandi Group. Please put your hands together for me to welcome sir. Also to be recognized is Dr. Joseph Uten Bison. Welcome. Commissioner for Education Cross River State, Senator Dr. Stephen Ode. Please you're recognized and you please welcome. Member Cross River State House of Assembly representing Akampa One. Honorable Okun Owuna. Please you're welcome and you please recognize. May I also recognize the clan head of Bidia, the local government area at the University of Calabar for her speech. And that's the other person, and Professor Florence Banco. Can we put those hands together for our dear Vice President? The Chairman of Education, our own father, who has earlier been introduced to us, our guest lecturer the friends of the guest lecturer, my boss, who are here. I want to recognize everybody who has come here today. The uniform heads of different organizations, security organizations and agencies. I recognize you. Time is fast spent. And it's no fault of the guest lecturer, nor us. The guest lecturer is declared to time, and 10.30 was ready. I kept pleading that it shouldn't come, because the place was virtually empty. I kept monitoring and monitoring, and hence, three years, I have been struggling to bring this guest lecturer. And each time, each year, his calendar is ever. And also, they didn't know the season. For us Catholics, it's a special season. And that is why I really want to thank and appreciate him for living in the houses at this time of the calendar of the Catholic Church to be here with us. And thank you so very much, my Lord, for also coming to support him. Our own is ever here with us. And any time we call him, he will come. I just want to assure our chairman, the seventh vice chancellor of this university, that this administration will, of course, you said you have a child who has told you how many different semesters and sessions we run. In fact, when you said they should take a break, I heard somebody say, tell them. I'm sure they were saying, tell them this. <laughs> they are really working very hard. And um, in that way, 
Any student who gets a, a grade now desires the grades. And our students are working very hard to earn the grades they earn. Gone were the days that we say people buy degrees. Today, the quality assurance, the senate of the university has put in mechanisms that has really shared up the quality of graduates we produce. And just to say that uh, we, this hall, you see, is, is helpful. Simple reason that the students know that uh, it's not uh, business as usual. If it were those days, students would have all been here. But today they are writing exams and they know it's not business as usual. You either write your exams or you fail your exams. And that is why you see them all hiding and burying themselves somewhere and reading for the examinations. Why we have, I am quite proud and I'm quite happy that today we are really producing the number of students we are producing. We are going to graduate tomorrow more than 10,000 undergraduate students. More than 10,000. When I addressed the press, I told them it was still counting. Why I said it was still counting, 8,000 was still counting. Because I know my heads of departments and deans were busy bringing in more results. So I, I really thank them, they are doing fantastically well. And then, um, we, by tomorrow you know they call the number of uh, first, the first class is across with our affiliate institutions, the seminary St. Joseph and um, the Port Harcourt, where we also have um, affiliate institutions there. So we are happy, I won't want to keep you bored more because we are all anxious to hear our guest lecturer. And now I want to welcome each and every one of you. Please, if you have not been specially recognized, don't feel bad. The Chairman, Traditional Rulers Council, is sitting here with us, who also doubles as the Paramount Ruler of Bakasi. Sir, we welcome you. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And I think at the appropriate time, more recognition will be done. Thank you. Thank you, my love, for coming. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Very distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I do not know if Bishop Cooker can sweep, but I'm sure that a 36 convocation of the University of Calabar has caught a big fish. Papa is a priest. A teacher, a man of conscience, and a public intellectual. His Lordship Matthew Hazan Kuka, the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto, is an unrelenting advocate for justice, human rights, and development. He has had positive interventions in promoting respectful interfaith relations in Nigeria and the constructive management of our differences and diversity. With authority inspired by conviction, knowledge, erudition, spirit, and the goodness of God, Bishop Kuka has railed against injustice and the unfortunate instrumentalization or weaponization of religious and ethnic identities in Nigeria. Bishop Matthew Hazan Kuka heads from the Bakulu ethnic group in Zangro Qatar local government area of Kaduna State. Diversity in ethnicity and religion in Zangro Qatar far neighboring areas, with its attendant beauty and troubles, makes it a true reflection of the Nigerian mosaic, the background of our lecturers, our lecturers upbringing. Even his name, Matthew Hazan Kuka, is a reflection of that diversity. He was born in 1952, attended St. in Zaria and Jaws, and was a daily Catholic priest in 1976 
at the age of 24. He also studied in the University of Ibadan and obtained a diploma in religious studies. He was also in the University of Bradford, United Kingdom for a master's degree in peace studies, which he also backed in 1980. He was at the School of African and Oriental Studies, University of London, where he earned his PhD in 1990. Bishop Kuka was a senior Rhodes Fellow at St. Anthony's College, University of Oxford, and the Edward Mason Fellow at the University of Go at the School of Government, Harvard University. For Bishop Kuka, the priestly vocation is for public service, and service to man is also service to God. As Professor Chidi Odin Kaluka chose it. Kuka's altar serves as a platform while the country is his congregation. <laughs> Our lecturer was a member of the Nigerian Investigation Commission of Human Rights Violations, popularly known as the Obuta Commission. He was the secretary of the National Political Reform Conference in 2005 and a member of the committee, a member of the Nigeria Peace Committee charged with the responsibility of mediating peace among candidates during elections. Bishop Kuka was appointed Bishop of Sokoto Catholic Diocese in 2011, a diocese in the heartland of Islam in northern Nigeria, covering Zamfara, Sokoto, and Kebi states. Characteristically, he has fostered amity and enriched a conversation that promotes the common good across all seeming divides within the diocese and beyond, operating with accustomed ease from his office near the seat of the Sokoto Caliphate. In 2020, he was appointed by Pope Francis as a member of the Dicastry on Integral Human Development. In his trident, advocacy and championing of good causes, Bishop Kuka demonstrates both phenomenal intelligence, deep knowledge of social processes, and the fact that he's a product of the best institutions of learning in the world. But beyond irreduction of all that is his love for humanity and development. He's a humanical spirit, his conviction and courage to speak truth to power have forged for this bishop of Nigeria a marriage with history and posterity that will ever be a shining example. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present and invite you to join me in welcoming the 36th Convocation Lecturer at the University of Calabar, the Bishop of Nigeria, and a messenger of God, His Lordship Matthew Hazan Kuka. Thank you. Vice Chancellor successfully delivered standing. I felt a bit comfortable that uh, you will be able to see me from where I am standing. <laughs> I bring you greetings from Sukoto, Excellency the Chairman, Madam Vice Chancellor, Lordships, distinguished lecturers, my dear students, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here. 
Now, as you know, it is uh, men who propose to women. And uh, I haven't seen any woman say no to a proposal. But uh, I'm happy that Prof herself made the point because when she proposed to me <laughs> and asked me to deliver this lecture, I did one of the most irrational things. I said, yes, yes, Prof, yes. Without checking the time of day, without checking my diary, without checking. So it was when I got back to Sokoto that I realized the problem I was in. One, I had committed myself to delivering a lecture uh, to mark the 25th anniversary of Father uh, Ellis, uh, I mean, uh, Ellis place in LL. And uh, then, of course, as she rightly said, it was Holy Week, and that uh, I have to be back to Sokoto uh, for Palm Sunday. But I think I'm eternally grateful to God that somehow, somehow, everything has to come together because in between was inserted the ordination of two bishops accompanying their brother. <laughs> and I don't want to say that they accompanied me out of love because uh, Bishop Musa, before he became bishop, actually represented me here in Calabar at the ordination of Bishop Christopher. So when he said he had I was coming here, he was anxious to follow me. I don't know whether it was to renew his friendship with the bishop or whether... And then, of course, very early in the day, we were offered accommodation at the hotel. And actually, the vice chancellor literally compelled Bishop Nasseri to take a room in the hotel. But I'm not sure whether his enthusiasm in leading us here is unconnect, not, un not unconnected with making sure that his pension is secure. <laughs> So I think we have actually accompanied him. He hasn't accompanied us. Um, the chairman said, and he's a professor of soil science, and I'm shocked that he will be wondering how diversity and harmony can be together. Okay, this building is sanding. It's a mixture of sand. And a mixture of other things and water and so on. So you can't say that you, you understand that without water, without brick, without this building will be standing. But I will come to that in my lecture. I want to say how very, very grateful on a serious note I am. Um, I open with a quotation from a man called Valerie Poilet, who said, A people overwhelmed by mediocrity condemns itself to failure and misery when they know more about football than their own human rights when they scream louder for a goal than for injustice and when you know how passionate you remember after our failed attempt to win the africa cup of nations how nigerians vilified all players a young man gallant enthusiastic who opted to play for nigeria rather than england Poor Iwobi became the weeping dog. And I wonder, you know, Nigerians know how to cope with local government chairmen that are not performing, governors that are not performing, presidents, politicians, senators that are not. But they know how to write to the Vatican to complain about their bishop. But they don't know how to write to local uh, complain about how ineffective our political system is. However, my, what I've done is I have a paper, but normally what I do, and I'm happy the university didn't put pressure on me to deliver them the paper. But I normally, I have a paper that is written, and I probably will make some additions or subtractions to it, depending on maybe subsequent reaction. But maybe during the week, you'll get a clean version of the paper. It's already fully written, but just if there is need. Now, I deliberately chose this theme, and actually I surprised myself because Every year, I probably get no less than 40, 50 invitations across Nigeria and international to come and speak. So people ask me, how do you manage? But I, I tell them, and they are surprised, that I manage to take only about a fraction of the invitations that I get. 
And I discovered uh, when I started putting papers together that I received definitely no less than 30 invitations to speak at convocation lectures across Nigeria. I put together a publication. No, I'm not, this is not my CV. I'm not, I'm not promoting myself. I'm just trying to put things in context. But what struck me was um, I decided that I would put together my, some of my convocation lectures, and I chose 15. Uh, 14 or 15, and they've been published, they were published last year. Actually, I thought I would, because when I speak, I don't think about what I spoke at the other venue. But what I found interesting was that unknown to me, I had actually been obsessed, literally, with the notion of national cohesion or national unity. So, uh, my concerns about how Nigeria needs to be properly organized have been with me for a long period of time. And I've come to the conclusion, of course, it's natural that unless and until we're able to get all of this, a proper understanding, what constitutes diversity? Is it an asset? Is it a liability? Deputy Governor, sir, it doesn't matter that your tribe is not listed among those of my life. But even the Boki people that are listed, they don't become Deputy Governor. <laughs> so, you know, they say that, uh, they say, they say that uh, Sam Bakwe, you know Sam Bakwe, many of you remember, those of you who are here, you know Sam Bakwe. I know Sam Bakwe would probably never have participated in a beauty contest. But he, one day he went to speak to the student at the University of Nigeria, Suka. It's anecdotal, but they said he looked at the students. He said, eh, when I say, Mbakwe no fine, Mbakwe no fine. You are far away from the governor. <laughs> so, um, but what is very significant and very important is that when I also looked up my own little ethnic group, which is smaller than their own because we don't produce anybody of your quality. But when I discovered, that mine was not included. I said, no, these people have not finished out. But the good news for you, sir, the list has been updated. It's about 450 now. Go back and check. And you might find your ethnic group. <laughs> but now, beyond all this, it is all to, to say that I'm already speaking to my paper. Because it is all, it's also a wonderful account as to how this country is not progressing. Because, okay, imagine any of you now, you go home and just tell your wife, hey, please, cook food, cook food. I'm expecting visitors tomorrow. Tomorrow is Sunday, cook food, cook food. And the wife said, okay, I'll cook food, but how, for how many people? Just cook, some people are coming. I'm sure your wife will still insist. I need to have an idea. How many people are we cooking for? Just cook. I say my friends are coming. That means two things will happen. Because it will, everything will never be right. Even if she obeys you and went out to cook, there will either be more food than people or less food than people. Or there will be food for adults, but no food for children. So critical to our existence as a nation is our utter negligence to the whole question of who are we? The critical question, who are we? Americans are still asking that question. Germans, everybody, people are still asking, even the return of autocracy and authoritarianism across Europe and America suggests very clearly that assumptions that people had about who they are, identities are in constant mutation. The result is that those who were oppressed yesterday have now come to the table. So I met the point of very well that I have a clip actually which we would have played, but it's the speech that Namdi Aziki will deliver. Some of you must have seen it on the social media. We can make all this appeal to our world of war, made appeal to our world of war, to Sandauna, to Amin Okano, to Sami Koko, to Opara, everybody. Let's unite. Because Nigerians and Africans were obsessed with unity. That we needed to unite so that we'll drive the British. I remember at independence, these young bishops were not born. But me, I carried, what shocked me about the discussion was our teacher tried to explain to us how these useless white people came and stole our resources, they destroyed our country. Now we are independent. I couldn't understand because the first white person I'd ever seen in my life was the Reverend Father. And he was a very good man. And the second person I'd ever seen who was a, also a white person was a, 
a, a reverend sister and they treated me well. So where these terrible people no idea in my innocent mind. But then what was even more dramatic was that they gave us small, small flags. I've never seen a flag in my life. And told us that we are going to wave them tomorrow. And then the most beautiful part of it, they gave us a cup. I've never had a cup in my life. You know, the talk of my, we were drinking from Calabash in my village. I saw a cup, owned a cup for the first time. And I couldn't make out why will celebrating horrible people be rewarded in this way. But as you know, the obsession of our people was that if only we became united, everything would be honky dory. Now, the rest, of course, is about the conversation of the future of Nigeria. However, we can not continue this conversation without paying attention to some really prophetic voices that more or less have the ability to amplify what the former deputy governor, former vice chancellor was saying. What about those who are not in the room? Because the British colonial administration deliberately, deliberately sowed the seeds of the volatility of the Nigerian state. Under the Westminster parliamentary system, we are three regions and finally the Midwest was created more or less. It was not necessarily because it made political sense. It was one way of punishing uh, a section of Nigeria, which I will not name, or two sections of Nigeria. Because in the 1957, in the report of the 1957 Willing Report, it was very well stated, very clearly, the nature of the ag agitation and the contestations of the minorities. And the minorities in what is now the South, I will say, look, we, we, we feel that we will not be able to survive the domination of the Igbos. In the same way that the minorities in the Midwest were saying, we will not be able to survive the oppression of the Yorubans. We're already feeling it. <clears throat> and then if you came from the part of Nigeria like where I come from, in the Middle Belt, and you're even a Christian minority, we said, no, we will not, we are choking. And the report said very clearly, it articulated our fears, our anxiety, because the name of the commission was the commission set up to inquire into the fears of the minorities and to find ways to allay them. That was the title of the, of the, of the, of the committee. They made the submission. Go back, I'm sure those of you are doing political science 101, you probably have an idea what I'm talking about. So you can check the record. They, if you, it's there on Google. If you Google it, you'll find it, the Willing Commission report. You can see that some of the things that minority ethnic groups talked about, 60 years later, remain unresolved, especially if you come from the Middle Belt, as I said, and you are from uh, the minorities and a Christian in Northern Nigeria. Because all the fears were articulated. Namely, that look, we had come under the jackboot of a jihadist, uh, um, a jihadist movement that has subsisted for 100 years, known as the Sokoto Caliphate. And it's very interesting that, you know, colonial historiography, the way the colonialists wrote history, is not the same with the way history. Thank God for people like Escotoyo, all your people who were here, all those great masters who did fantastic scholarship to expose the fact that we really should not be talking about, because if you read British history, the British were saying, instead of, they talked about the pacification, okay? It was post-colonial scholarship that said, because the British said, we pacified this ethnic group because they were, we came and met you already fighting with yourselves anyway, so we pacified you. And then Western, the subsequent scholarship said, no, you conquered us. Yours was, and it was only through that, change of language, that you could now understand the tyrannical systems that the British put in place. But notwithstanding that, what was also very interesting was that there's a narration, popular literature, popular history suggests that somehow the British conquered, they say, the Sokoto Caliphate in 1903, and they conquered the Caliphate because of the superiority of their weapon. That's what the historians tell us. But then, for that Digging into the history suggests a completely different conclusion. And unless and until you understand the historical, the cultural, the, the political, even the ideological configuration of what was, what is today the Middle Belt and part of even the North itself, you will buy into that argument. Because in reality, subsequent history suggests very clearly that the houses, Kano, 
what is now Kano State, Katsina State, Kaduna part of Kaduna State, and so on. Agitated, and they also were anxious for the British to come. Because they have been enslaved, just like the minorities in the Middle Belt. They have been, they've been treated as, not treated as, they were slaves, enslaved by the, those who fought the jihad. And so, very interestingly, there are songs that are now available that were sung by houses. Father Bishop Jera here is. The song said, I quoted it when I was doing my PhD thesis. It says something like, it's better if the English translation doesn't capture it well. So these people hearing news about the coming of the British now saw these people as liberators. And the waiting was so much that they composed a song that said, white people, why is it taking you so long to come? Are your horses chameleons? We've been waiting. And you know, this, they were the ones who they gave directions, they were car baggage carriers, they were soldiers, they were all kinds of things. They were the ones who helped the British get to where the caliphate was. So what am I saying? The point I'm making therefore is that Nigeria remains a work in progress, largely because we still do not have a clear sense of who we are. Now, Marxist scholarship, we did a very good job with being different shapes of scholars and continue to interpret what really are the issues. From the 70s to the 80s, the big debate was what is called the national question. And then in the 90s, 2000 and beyond, we've been talking about what is true federalism. We want true federalism. And now, Dinebu is in power. He was also the, the, the apostle of federalism. And we are now come to a point in which Nigerians are literally beginning to feel everybody wants to go their separate way. Because we are tired. Every group of Nigerians will tell you we are tired. We are exhausted. Because we, can, we are working and we cannot see the result. And what is the reason? So we are now even finding excuses. We become independent, yes, in the 60s, but our democracy is not working. We've changed systems. We were Westminster, we were a colonial state, then we became provinces and regions, and then subsequently we then came under the military, and then after the military finished, and their own form of colonialism was worse than that of the colonial administration, because at least colonial administration left us a few very practical things, including universities, okay, including processes, including due process, including measurable changes in our life that we could see. Now, the military, of course, left us without a constitution, because constitutions were always the first casualties of military rule. They incapacitated our ability to make laws. The result is that most of what you now see as a culture of violence and toughness and anger and frustration is bred out of that culture. And before I end, I will say one or two things about where we are today. But of course, the result is that we are saying something must be wrong with us. Was it colonialism? We don't know. But again, in the last 20 years, Nigerians have been nostalgic. Some people say, let the British even come back and take this thing. Probably. Oh yes, and it's happening in universities and musicians and so on and so forth. But then there are those who suggest that perhaps what is wrong is the nature of the system we are given to administer. They gave us democracy. Now you hear a lot of people saying there are traditional rulers here. We're saying, how does it, we Africans are communitarian, we Africans are uh, family oriented, we Africans cannot understand democracy we, in our languages, we don't know the meaning of the word opposition we are told there is something called loyal opposition that is the opposition has got a, a, a reason to exist and must be taken as part and parcel of democracy they also say this democracy is measured by multipartyism that is there must be a multiplicity of parties and we are saying because of our ethnic configuration the problems are that every ethnic group wants to have a party we are giving that as an excuse. But there is no country in the world that surpasses the United States of America in terms of language, culture, diversity, everything. Even my language is spoken in America. It will be difficult to find any language in the world that doesn't have, is not spoken in America. It may not be spoken in Washington, but there are part, no, it is difficult to find any part of America today and you won't find. So if America has become the most powerful nation in the world, diversity cannot be an excuse.
Secondly, if we say that somehow God made a mistake, that's why we have so many, so many tongues. Well, Somalia has only one ethnic group. Who wants to go and live in Mali? All these who are doing their part, don't they have nobody has ever bought a ticket to go to Somalia? <laughs> Somalia has only one ethnic group. But who wants to go and live in Somalia? For over 20 something years, Sudan was fighting. South Sudan said, We want to be on our own. The Muslims say, Okay, you people will go. They, they went. They have not slept in peace since they became independent seven years ago. Today, as I'm talking to you, there are, at least BBC announced two days ago, there were over 18 million refugees in Sudan. So, so neither social cohesion, nor cultural cohesion, nor ethnic cohesion by themselves are sufficient as explanations for the volatility of a country. It is more the ability or inability to manage the diversity that opportunity creates. These are really the issues. So, for example, the, the Christ Assembly is saying that we are celebrating. 40 students with first class, over for and still counting. 400 or whatever with uh, second class of, of you know, PhDs. And we are still counting. We must be the most unserious of people in the, in the world. Because in all of these numbers, remember, don't tell me because we are all Christian. We may have most of us here are baptized, confirmed. There are bishops here, there are priests here. Jesus left only 12 semi illiterate people. <laughs> only one dropped off, only 11. And then to make matters worse, when Jesus was leaving them, he said to them, Take this gospel to the end of the world. And then he qualifies it by saying, In carrying this gospel to the end of the world, oh, carry no hamasan, don't carry money, don't carry sandals. Okay. If I had been an apostle, I would, okay. You are going away. You, have never, you never told us anything about the end of the world. We, we don't even know where the world is. But you are telling us to take the gospel to the end. Then you are telling us not to carry it. What are we supposed to do? You should have started this journey while you were still alive. It's now that you are ascending that you are telling us to. But guess what? Jesus says, calm down, calm down, calm down. I am going to give you the Holy Spirit. Now, all of us sitting here, 95% of us have received the Holy Spirit. And no, let's say we have received the Spirit. Now, whether it is holy, whether the result of this Spirit, so, so we cannot be sitting here and finding excuses. I'm saying, therefore, that even within this hall, those 40 first class people can change Nigeria. Of course, you might say that we cannot change because they, 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 they they won't let us. That is the excuse for the lazy man. They won't let us. But the point I'm making is, rather than turning governance into an intellectual exercise, because if you notice now, academia, you are lucky, bro, you are lucky. And it feels that the best a professor can be in Nigeria is vice deputy governor. Okay? Yes. And there are no politicians. Now, you know, people holding this microphone, they train them. People holding these cameras, they are all trained. People who did this ceiling may not have gone to school, but they are trained. Politics is the only thing that doesn't require a certificate. <laughs> Every other job you want, they ask you, do you have experience? Every job you apply for in Nigeria, they tell you, do you have experience? Do you have exposure? What is your quality? You want to be vice chancellor? Show us your paper. You want to be a lecturer, show us your paper, and we'll check whether it's fake or original. But if you want to join politics, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I have two friends, I have a friend who was quite a very strong politician. So he, he contested the election, and he had a direct one of the senior people who was his campaign man. So he called me to report because the result of the elections came and he didn't do well. So he now reported the letter to me. That look, this your friend, this our friend. He was the one that made my campaign manager. There is no really show sure anything. I am bringing because I have a case. So the book appointment with me, they came to see me. What is the problem? I gave this guy 500, I mean 5 billion naira 
for a particular local government. The result, what I got there, didn't add up. He chopped my money. So they came to me. So what you so he told me, okay, tell me that. So he told me a story. So they accused. I said, oh God. Did this man give you money? Yes, sir. Yes, Bishop. Give me money. How much? He's correct. Give me five million. He said that you didn't spend the money and that he wants to speak. He, he said, I, I want to see account, statement of account. So the man looked, the accused looked at me. He said, Bishop, they know they give receipt for politics now. <laughs> receive in politics. So, are you therefore surprised by the quality of politics that we have? So, point I'm making is, we are fighting with the tools, and these tools have worked elsewhere. For example, it's an open question, and I've asked political scientists and historians to tell me this. I don't know any other country in the world that was colonized by the British, whether it's Singapore, whether it's India, whether it's South Africa, whether it's Ghana, whether it's Gambia. Any other country that was colonized by the British that has created states. If you know, you tell me. I don't know myself. I've tried to scratch my head. I can't find a single country. Because when you go back and look at the kind of people that came, it took me a long time to realize that most of the British colonial officers that came here were actually Oxford graduates. The people who came to Nigeria have studied ethnography, they have studied anthropology, they understood the cultural diversities of Nigeria. All the drawings and the lines that they drew, all of those lines, we are hardly arbitrary. And we should go back and look at our regions and our provinces. They were not precise, but they formed the foundation for us to stay together. We came, the military came, even the creation of states that was that we created. Creation of states was not something that was debated and discussed and so on. The, the states were created as an emergency decision to stop Ojuku from going to war. Okay, that was the reason why states were created. Then we woke up one day and discovered, okay, we need to create another round of states. They became 19, from 19 to 21, from 21 to 36. The last thing I read last month was that in the National Assembly now, there is a bill, and hopefully we want to now end up having, I think, 48 or 49 states. Now, we are assuming that rather than increasing the food on the table, the solution to our problem is to create more tables. <laughs> All right? And every time, because this simple political science suggests very clearly that it is not so much when you increase the political space. What happens is that and you can see in the history of state creation in Nigeria. I'm arguing, therefore, that rather than trying to resolve the problem, the result to what I call the miniaturization of the Nigerian state and its balkanization. Most of this is not arbitrary. Supreme so soldiers just sat down in their council meeting and they decided, today you can hear people tell you, they gave me a state, they gave me a state, they gave me a state. It was worse with local government areas. They just distributed these things to themselves at, the meeting, at their meetings. You found that up to today there are communities that are still fighting over why a, a particular state capital was cited in the place, over why a local government headquarters was cited in the place, because the big boys with military collection, a connection of military kids is that managing diversity is an academic exercise. You know, and it's a great pity, really a great pity that you may have, I'm sorry to say, I don't I mean, these 10 places are the same everywhere in Nigeria. The average state in Nigeria has about three, four, five or so universities. And on a good day, you would imagine that if you have a university of this quality here, there are certain mistakes that politicians should not be allowed to make. But that is if they are engaging the intellectual capital that is available to them. So, the more states you create, the more units of corruption you just multiply. Because if you remember, every time a state was created, it didn't matter that people were not qualified. They just said, in those, and every time you created a new state, people burst into joy or freedom. Even though they were living together, marrying together, suddenly landlords began to throw people out of their house. Go, they have created a new state for you. 
And then people became permanent secretary who have just been middle level staff somewhere. And look at the, the evidence is there. But I'm saying, therefore, that this delayed our sense of nationhood. Because as we are creating new states, creating new units of identity, we are also unsure whether we are running a democracy or we are running a, a semi-feudal system. Okay? Because in the same way, in many states, like somebody was telling us yesterday, what state in Anna, in Anna Brother has 800 traditional rulers or whatever. And governors are using the creation of most traditional institutions to quote-unquote declare independence for communities. And every time you create these units, you have to, they have to be funded. The result is not funding education now, which is fundamental to a sense of how to develop the capacity to manage resources, manage our gifts, manage our talents. That is now something that is taken as secondary. So by way of trying to round up some of the stuff you can read in the paper, I want to come back to by way of conclusion. You say, look, when I chose this team, I think what uh, the vice chancellor said and what the former vice chancellor said, I already addressed you, staff. And I'm sure from what your vice chancellor has said, you are not a perfect university. But evidently, she has demonstrated a system of leadership that is sufficiently consultative. And the result is so the results that you are finding are not contrived results. One of the terrible things that have happened, and I've spoken about it several across this country, is that federal universities funded with, funded with federal funds have been turned into enclaves of ethnicity and ethnic politics. There are many universities today that the, the, the issue of where the vice chancellor will come from is not subjected to the rigor of intellectual qualification, that it is the tongue of our tribe, and we must produce a vice chancellor, whether you like it or not. Now, when you create leadership based on those kind of models, what you have is, I think so, there's a time, I think. But we are chatting. They said, he became vice chancellor. And tell, told the student, the young people in this village, if you want to come to university, come talk to me first. Show me your paper so I can help you choose the right course. He said, one day, he was sitting down, a young man came to read him, he said, he's from the village. Okay, I want to enter university. He said, okay, which are they? Can I see your results? He said, no, sir. Vice Chancellor, sir. I want to become, I want the subject combination that can get me a job in Costco. That's what I want. <laughs> What's the kind of subject combination that can get me a job? And of course, somebody told me about a young man. The man from his village became Vice Chancellor. No, the neighboring village became Vice Chancellor. So he went, knelt, and I said, look, they, you know, and the Igbos are constructively competitive. They really like their competition because it engenders growth as long as it is properly managed. But they find that these people are two doctors and we are no doctor. We must do something about it. So this young man went because the other village had three doctors and they had nothing. So he now said he must be the first medical doctor in the village. So he went to the vice chancellor. The vice chancellor said, go to the register, let them check you out. So they checked the records. He said that they saw Igbo. He got credit in Igbo. Uh, maths. He failed maths. He failed every, so the last other subject was, I think, geography. He got credit in geography. And then uh, biology or something. That's about all he did. So the registers, this is not, it will be hard though. He said, no, I'm not leaving this office. I must become a medical doctor. So the register, all the patients say, okay, look, this is what we'll do. This you are Igbo, and you have learned in school, and you got a credit. This geography, I want you to go to the forest and identify trees, flowers that have medicinal uses, and then you use the Igbo for incantation, so you can, so you can become, you can become a Dibia, but medical doctor, you have you, have you. The price you pay if you decide that you are going to lower the standards. Now, Vice Chancellor, I mean, former Vice Chancellor, let me come back to the point why I chose this team. In the paper, I use the image of an orchestra. All of you know what orchestra is. Now, all the, all the instruments for an orchestra, they are all different instruments, totally different. It is the business of the conductor. 
to bring all of these instruments into harmony. So leadership, see, see my dear people, leadership is an activity. It's not just a verb, it's an activity. Now, we confuse leadership with office. The two things are completely different. You can be a leader and not be in office. You can be in office and not be a leader. Okay, because if you are just in office, that is, if you came to office because the tone of your tribe, you will be in office. But the intellectual, the moral character and quality that you require to lead is already contaminated. You are holding a poison chalice. Because then what is going to lead you is the concern of your tribe and your community. You can have power. You can have leadership. Now, and you see that people who are leaders, many of them didn't hold office. Never hold office. For example, when you think about presidents of Nigeria today, if you line them up today, most people would probably identify a wall of identify a middle column, identify them, those who never became president. So, critical to this, therefore, what I'm saying is that critical to this is, one, the identification of the kind of resources that you have. And then you are building the qualities that other people have. Because if you cannot pick a team based on what you need. I remember um, this guy who was our coach, West Harhoff. In one of these famous football matches that Nigeria was going to play, it was the match, I don't remember the details, it was the match to determine whether we would go to the World Cup. And then there was this footballer, I don't remember his name, but two defenders he had to choose from. One of them was a fantastic defender. The second one, he was better than the second one. But West Ham decided to feel the second person. So they were shouting at him. So later on, of course, Nigeria won. But when they interviewed West Ham, I never forget it. West Ham said, I have to choose between these two defenders. But they are not my concern. My concern was JJ Okocha. Was in my worry. He said, because when JJ begins to enjoy the game, I can't find him in the pitch. <laughs> So he said, I needed a, he said, you see, I want a match with my local Nigerian man. And I was surprised. The coach changed the goalkeeper in the 80, 87th minute, three minutes to the end of the game. He didn't, the goalkeeper didn't show any sign of any injury. They took him out. On how to work, I mean, it was only afterwards. The coach knew that the goalkeeper on the bench was a better penalty stop. And he wanted the game to go into penalties. So, leadership is not about that you go to the first class, therefore you want to know. Leadership is having the, the instincts, the sensitivity, and the ability of knowing the people who are not So you can tell when a man, when a woman will start to go into the And first of all, the man is walking slowly. And he's not cleaning the car the way he normally cleans the car. He don't say anything. And he enters the car. He's driving. You can see evidently the man is not concentrating. You don't ask him any question. Maybe that morning, the man doesn't have the courage to say to you. But at least you will hear him. So a leader must be able to inspire. So for the page, the paper, I tried to explain the fact that. Managing diversity is fundamental. It's almost, I use the debate as I said, but not question. Let me end by asking a much more serious question. And I want to use the American experience to demonstrate the point that I'm going to make now. All of us say it doesn't matter whether you are reading physics, whether you are reading chemistry, whether you are going to the into, whether you are studying to be a priest. All of us must fundamentally understand the promises that are in our Constitution. Because if you don't understand what the Constitution says, 
about the quantum of rights that ought to be available to you, you will remain a victim of injustice. For example, the Nigerian Constitution, Chapter 2, from Section 15, I mean, Section 15, I just read out, I chose just four, and listen very carefully. National integration shall be actively encouraged, while discrimination on the grounds of place of origin, sex, religion, status, ethnic or linguistic association, or ties shall be prohibited. Two, intermarriage among persons from different places of origin or different religions, ethnic and linguistic association ties is to be encouraged. Three, we must promote or encourage the formation of association that comes across ethnic, linguistic, religious, or other sectional barriers. And finally, the state shall foster a feeling of belonging. Now, many people think that I have something against Buhari when he was present. After when you took all the key positions I gave to people of, of, of one of one locality, one faith. You therefore, by doing that, you people began to feel it has nothing to do with the same religion of Islam. But people began to worry about the love and other as of Islam. When you manipulate these identities, if you if you are a person, if you person, if you use the opportunity of your position to privilege your own people, what you will do is you will put all the members of your ethnic group into a kind of hostility. But people will begin to fix them directly. But they will say, ah, this is a new person, they don't come again. And yet we are not very representative of what they believe. So, when we see how much our constitution has been founded, the challenge for us is what are we to do? And here, by way of ending, I want to take you back very briefly to a speech that was delivered at the 28th of August 1963, a famous speech of Martin Luther King. I won't read, I won't read the speech. But if you go back and read that speech, why did Martin, why did they have this, this that event that took place on that day, 28th of August, 1963. They chose the date very carefully. Because it was 100 years after the Gettysburg speech of Abraham Lincoln. In which Abraham Lincoln made the proposition that democracy shall be a government of the people for the people by the Now, then of course you then have the first and most important document, the 1776. Um, document of the Declaration of Independence, American Independence. That document opened with the say, we are committed to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, when Martin Luther King took up this conversation, see, now, the speech, first of all, they chose the location. I don't know how many of you have been to Washington, but if you know the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, we have this because there's a huge statue of Lincoln that has been there. It's almost like the, what we see in the Catholic environment, statue of Blessed Lord. That's how Americans reverence the statue. That's where we speak to. And Martin Luther King decided to invoke the promises that were already in the Constitution. Martin Luther King did not use the Bible to make his case. He didn't use the Bible. Instead, he used the American Constitution and the Proclamation of Independence. And he said, first thing he said, and I quote, 100 years later, the Negro is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro still sadly crippled by the miracles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives in a lonely island of poverty in the midst of the vast ocean of prosperity. And so, and so, and as you know, the lawyer said, I will tell you, it's a criminal offense for you to issue a check and money no day for your account. It's a criminal offense. Police not is only. Thank you, sir. <laughs> now, but Martin Luther King said, we have come here to cash the check that was given to us 100 years ago. 200 years ago in 1776, 100 years ago, the, when, when the American Constitution was drafted and ratified, 
All right? Now we have come, after 200 years, we've got to cash a check. And it says, when the architects of our public wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were right. signing a promising note. Yes, Remember, good, checks right. in those days, a promise to pay on demand. When, that when every American was to fall there, this note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed their own inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The 1776 proclamation said that the American state exists to ensure that a space is created for people to be able to rightfully, gainfully struggle for a life of freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What constitutes that happiness is not mentioned. However, and this is one of the great things, Americans will tell you this is a country where you can be anything you want to be. It may not be the case that maybe the revolving door revolves every 100 years, but you are told that there is the possibility that you can be. How then do you survive in a country that tells you that because you are not ethnic, you are not a Libyan, you are not Igbo, you are not Hausa, you are not Yoruba, you are not Christian, you are not Muslim, a sign of organizes no pass. Because that is what we have in our country. We are a signboard exists by those in power directly or indirectly telling you that you are left out precisely because you are a child of a lesser God. But if you touch and say, no, this is not acceptable. All of us are entitled to this. Sorry. And he said in the speech, and this is this is the one, this is the life I, I love most. But people say to me, Bishop, you are a priest. Why shouldn't you just, why are you, you know, why are you talking? <laughs> you should not be sitting down in the church. In, especially now that I'm Bishop, I can just sit down, balance, my priest will be breaking. Yes, because every Bishop is doing cathedratic come down. Okay? And cathedratic an opportunity for me, for the people to bring gifts to the mission. So I can just sit down and collect all these gifts if I, I eat, I sleep, and read. I'm not answerable to anybody. Even if you report me to Pope, it's not. And people say to me, why are you risking your life? Why are you risking your life? I hear a lot of people say, they call me, you are in Sokoto. How are you so, how are you still talking? How are you in Sokoto? Because if you are really a Catholic priest, you lose your innocence. Some of the people, some of the most good people, they'll, excuse me, they'll be sons of the church. Some of the sons of the church. Jerry Rollins was joined by the Jesuit. One day when we met Jerry Rollins in Ghana, Jerry said, You know, the problem with the Catholic church is I grew up a good Catholic girl, but I became too angry. And the Catholic Church has already made me believe that if I kill a cockroach, God didn't give me that permission. Then Rolly said, I wanted to now kill people because they are done bad. So I had to suspend my impact <laughs> And of course, every time we suspend moral consenting beliefs because they are too difficult. That allows us to do other things. But people say to me, why do you continue to talk? And I said, because look, the Catholic Church has given me the best education I could ever have to match. And if you come from the kind of village I come from, believe me, I tell you and I promise you, if you come to my village, you will do what me, thousands of other people have always done, which is they come and they say, with all the men who are here, is it the kind of village you come from? <laughs> the only sign of federal presence that was registered in my village was when one of our boys died in the army. They brought his dead body. And I mean, they brought some of his things. That was because the federal government vehicle, the military vehicle was federal government. That was the first time we saw federal presence. <laughs> so, all of the things people are taking for granted here, we will never even enter the 20th century. And it's not because we have not got good in the education. 
But I said to people, by the grace of God, I've been to some of the best schools in the world. It is not here that I can see injustice and I will see this. It's not acceptable. Because I know that there is enough to go into the world. Now, my deluded king said, We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds. Because he said, When we took this check to the bank, we went to, to, to cash this check. Then he said, It is obvious that today America has defaulted on this promising note. Insofar as our citizens of color are concerned, Instead of honoring this sacred obligation that is attaching our check, America has given the Negro people a bad check. A check which has come back, but insufficient for We went to the bank, we submitted the check. Now we have been told the holder of this account has no funds to this account. And not because there are no funds, but there are no funds for black people. So many majority of our communities today, because you have no minister, because you have no governor, because you cannot produce a local government chairman, because you cannot produce a senator, all the checks of opportunity we take to the bank. They say insufficient. Now, Martin Luther King said, Martin Luther King said, we refuse to believe there are insufficient funds in this great world of opportunity. We refuse. And Nigerians will be ready to say, we refuse. It cannot be the case that to write it. So the confrontation for that is about violence. No. Because Martin Luther King said, we refuse to believe. And so we have come here to cast the check, a check that will give us or will demand these riches of freedom and justice. Then he finally says, there will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship right. This is 1963. Some of you were not born. Majority of you. 1963. This is what Martin Luther King said. In the process of getting our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. We will seek our rights not by the use of the weapons of oppression or violence that those who oppress us are No. So I make the point because I want to, as I said, conclude. I simply say, many of you are anxious to finish and leave Nigeria, which is okay, not a problem. But as I tell young people, if you want to go, you can go. But this morning I opened the internet and I saw an article, an interview with a young Nigerian called Fatai Adeshino, who has just graduated from from the, from the United Kingdom. And the title of it is that he says, the land, the pasture, is greener at home than abroad. Then, yes, quote me, you can go back to He says, the land, the pasture, is greener in Nigeria than abroad. The only thing is that, not everybody will go abroad is enjoying it. The only thing is that, those are people who went to Lagos. You go and you are too ashamed to say you haven't achieved anything. There's a young man, I have to too much time. There's a young man, my driver, when I was in Lagos, Secretary General, one of my drivers came to me. Because they, when I became Secretary General, they used to, I said, nobody would ride motorcycle again. You have to use a car to go to the embassy to collect this. So we bought an old second hand video, 504. So my driver, Obila, came to me. That day he came and left that. It was on the 19th of December. I just finished celebrating my birthday of the nation anniversary. So after my he came and knelt down. I said, Bishop, please, I meant Father, please, I beg you. I need a favor. I said, no, don't talk to me, you need stand up. He said, no, I don't want to stand up. I said, then I won't talk to you. So he got up. He said, this is good. I beg, make me just carry on. I want to live here on the 20th. 20, uh, I'll be back on the 26th with the motor. I said, okay, this motor can no reach. Uh, where are you from? He said, I'm from Anamba. This motor can reach. He said, it will reach. 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 So I said, but what? Because there were four drivers. I said, what about that driver? He said, but I'm not going to tell anybody. When they reach, I will just carry them quietly. Then I couldn't understand. 
Why is it that so what do you want to? I can pay your transport money if you have a problem. He said, Father, you don't understand. I said, no, I will pay for you. I'm going and coming by. He said, no. Then he said to me, see, they can tell you for my town where I come.
who, is, who knows how to tell our cousin. And he convinced us. He said, you see that this, we, we grew, I grew up near a river. He said, you see all this? All of us, when you are children, your spirit is always inside this ground. You come and sit down here in your spirit and be looking at these women as they are coming to fetch water. The one that you like, you just jump and enter his stomach. That is how the woman is. So it was right. Made it all right. Was a refugee. Uh, Obama did not come from any significant uh, opportunity. And near our home. Obama Sanjo is my very good friend. One day we were talking, he was president, and I went to the villa for a meeting. So he had not come out yet. So I just sat down and said, they should bring, they asked me, he said, bring me a cup of coffee. So I was drinking coffee. Obama Sanjo came out and said, are you just coming here? You come and start drinking coffee. Are you the president? I said, no, I, I said, I'm not the president. This is, I said, this is my, I said, no, sir, this is not the house, it's our own. <laughs> and you know, the great thing about Ambassador is, even up to now, there's nothing I cannot tell you. So, he said, I'm president. I said, yes, sir. But you know, me, I've never been to a police station. You, you came from prison. <laughs> Police never arrest me up till today. Eh? Commissioner, I'm not the only one. But so, Obama Sanjo came from prison to be president. Good Lord, Jonathan said he became president. He didn't have shoes. Many of you have shoes here. So please, don't be patient with yourself. And in the university, please make friends. Make friends. Don't succumb to tribal affiliation. Make friends. There are some of those girls, some of those boys that people don't want to talk to before the majority leader of the party. You never can tell. So please, I beg you, be patient. And do not succumb to the tragedies of the moment because the future can be bright. You see, see what America did. Many of you have heard of Floyd, the young man who was killed. You also have heard of uh, Deborah, the young lady who was killed in Sokoto. Now, you see, you see what Americans did. After they killed Floyd, because, look, mad people will do mad things. Mad people will do mad things. You can't stop it. But you can make it difficult for them to get away with it. You, well, we must have a country in which nobody, I repeat, nobody can take your life without process. So if we are living in this country and somebody can slaughter another human being, the boy was not only the person who was killed in Sokoto, just last year in the same Sokoto, a young a Muslim was also killed by another Muslim on grounds of blasphemy. And you have criminals running around terrorizing other people on grounds of a religious belief that they themselves don't understand. And then you still cannot try anybody. Ku Klux Klan was killing black people in America before the, the country said, no, you cannot. You take a life, you pay for it. How you pay for it is a different matter. But the man who killed um, Floyd, guess what? How many years he's serving in prison? He's in prison. And you'll be, I think it's 30 years they gave him. He's in, you'll be in prison for a long time. He went to prison in his 30s, he'll come out in his late 60s. But guess we care whether they shut down the city council. You take a life, you pay for it. You bought a church, you rebuild it. You bought a mosque, you rebuild it. Otherwise, there are no laws against killing a bishop or killing a... No, there's no law against killing a bishop or killing a priest. But there's a law against murder. The subject is not important. <coughs> it doesn't mean that if you kill a bishop, you will get higher sentence than if you kill a lame man or a blind man. So unless we get to that level of equality, we, we have diversity. But we are not harmonizing it, and we are not harmonizing diversity, which is why we are not developing. I will not develop until we learn the art of managing diversity. I thank you for your patience, and I have God to bless you. Thank you very much.
We are privileged today to enjoy you by hosting you in our university. A special thank to all the participants who are here, especially our traditional rulers and also the security personnel. And I've seen most of the politicians in Crossover State, they are here. I want to thank you for this sacrifice you have made to be here today. And I think that the lessons we have learned will go back to our different local government and states and try to see, not looking at uh, diversity as a problem. Diversity is not a problem, but as the guest speaker said, is managing this diversity so that it will bring benefits to the society you are living. There's no way you cannot see diversity, even as I'm standing here. Look at my hands, look at my eyes, look at my legs. Look at, they are all having different functions, diverse functions. But yet, where they have been able to coordinate in my system to function as a human being, for me to be able to do what I'm doing now. So, please, as you have heard from him, let's try and see, don't be looking at your ethnic approaches in handling matters. Let's take all of us as they want and trying to bring development to our society. So we are very grateful. My Chancellor, Chairman of this gathering, we are grateful. Thank you very much. And, and finally, we we'll talk glory to God who has made this day possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairman, Committee of Deans. We are on item number 11, closing remarks by the Chairman, His Excellency Professor Vara. So, can we put those hands together? <laughs> agree with me that we've come to the end of today. Very exciting convocation lecture. The summary of it for me is education. We must endeavor to ensure that our, ourselves and our children are properly educated so that they can each understand the issues of the day. And when that is done, when we are given positions because you really cannot lead unless you have been given a position. When you have been given a position, adopt all the teach our diversities and we'll be able to have a harmonious country. Thank you very much for coming and God bless you all. Just a quick announcement, please. For all our invited dignitaries, please, after this, we will want you to join us at the Cross River State Community Hall here in the university. And then this evening, we'll also be inviting you by 7 p.m. We have a command performance at the Chima Chimino Theatre. We'd like you, you've been missing it over the years, and you've been losing something very vital. Please join us at that time, and you will never regret you were here. Then tomorrow we have uh, the first round of convocation ceremony for first degrees up to masters. And we're observing that they are the grand order. We want us to, especially the graduates, Please to be there on time. We want to stick to time and get things done properly. And if you're also coming, please come on time to get your seats so we put, we get all things done without much ado. So we'll take our closing prayer. After the prayer, we'll take the University of Calabas song. And then when that song is over, I want to play with us. 
please just remain where you are as the Vice Chancellor will lead our guest speaker and all others at the high table out of this particular place, this conference hall. Then I invite our Bishop, the Bishop of Calabar, Most Reverend Professor Christopher Nasseri, to please offer the closing prayer. Can we rise together to pray? the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Eternal and merciful Father, we thank you for this beautiful and wonderful day. We thank you for bringing us from our different homes, diverse as we are, to work together, to talk to each other, and look forward to the growth of our nation. We thank you for the beautiful message we have received from your Son, as destinations, and and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Unicarson. Please let's just remember. Unicar song, please. <laughs>